Good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange, the Native Plant Project, and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Wildland Seed Collection Responding to a Changing Market, presented by Ed Kleiner with Comstock Seed. Before I introduce our speaker, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions for the speaker or me, please type them into the questions pane of your control panel located at the top right of your screen at any time during the webinar. I will field the questions for the presenter after the presentation, but it helps us if you type questions during the webinar so that we have some ready in the queue. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you are welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Ed Kleiner and his wife Linda own Comstock Seed Company, which collects and sells thousands of pounds of native seed for projects in the Mojave Desert, Sierra, and Great Basin regions. Ed's interest in native plants dates back to the 1960s when his father, retired plant ecologist Ed Kleiner Sr., Sr., took him along on a research trip to Canyonlands National Park. Since then, he's gathered native seeds in every state west of the short grass prairies and has been collecting and selling them for nearly 32 years. Welcome, Ed, and thank you for presenting today. Howdy. Hi. All right. I'm going to make you the presenter now. And you can click show my screen anytime. There we are. Great. So somebody's listening, I take it. It's pretty quiet at this end. Oh, yeah. Everyone's on mute because right. otherwise we get weird feedback. So. All right. <laughs> well, howdy, everybody. I, I hope you're all having a good lunch. Um, I have been in the business for 32 years now. We're in our 32nd spring. And way back 30 years ago, we spent most of our time concentrating on shrub seed. Um, I worked with a, a cousin up in Wyoming, and they were busy with Wyoming and Montana strip coal mines, which were doing a good job of growing grass seed, but not much else. And slowly but surely along came mandates to diversify what they were planting onto these sites. Thus, the demand for shrub seed, sagebrush in particular, started the launch. It was no time at all before we realized the diversity and the possibility, the potential for growth in, in a wide variety of natives and we started traveling widely in the western US. I'm going to go immediately to the evolving markets up at the top of this introduction. Originally, it was coal mines, traditional utilities, um, not much else. Um, but since then, the markets have evolved into a wide variety of demands for native seed. Uh, we're trying to race with that demand, partly by growing seed, networking with others to collect seed, but collecting is still a vigorous, big, widespread uh, uh, occupation in the western U.S. Um, I am going to spend a little time with the historic and show you the context. Then in the body of this, we're going to go through the mechanics, which are pretty cut and dry, um, fairly simple for us. But there are modern tools, technology that does a lot of native seed collecting, including combines and, and then seed cleaning issues. I'm going to show you a wide variety of species that bring out immediate issues for seed collectors, indeterminacy, weeds, time, geography, remoteness, all of those. Initial field processing we do, obviously money in moving material uh, from remote locations to central cleaning facilities is a big issue. Also, we like to leave as much of the organics in the field. We don't like to bring much out of the field. Um, our impacts out there are relatively benign compared to the users of the, of the public lands that we're used to, such as those mines and highways and corridors. But we like to collect as little as possible out of the field, economizing on taking those materials to a central cleaning facility and generating less leftovers as we clean and screen seed. Then in, towards the end, I'm going to indulge in a few screens that are covered with writing and small fine print, the horror screens you might call them, but I've tried to highlight highlight them, make them easy to follow. And we've moved into custom collection contracts, new age stuff that we're doing, and then conclusions. So I'm going to advance here and move on. Uh, this screen, a lot of our, our my uh, screens will show you a wide variety of visual photos that are easy to follow, and each slide obviously has a million words associated with it. But from this screen, you can see that the, here's the southern Mojave up in the upper left. I, I think you can all see my cursor. 
but it's showing uh, the expansion of existing and new uh, utility corridors. A lot of them are to accommodate incoming solar. Um, so we have a lot of work traveling through the eastern Mojave of Southern California that eventually requires some reclamation work. And Mojave is a unique place. You just don't grow XYZ generic grasses down there. You do not take species of shrubs and flowers out of the cold deserts or, or say, uh, the Midwest and drop them into the Mojave Desert. The Mojave Desert essentially is a, a massive shrub community, succulents, cacti, yucca, that sort of things, ephemerals in the grasses and flowers, but very ephemeral. And so it's a very distinct market that you need, uh, that requires a unique genetic makeup for seed for reclamation purposes. Um, that's part of today's trends, is moving towards local genetic materials and away from widespread use of, of uh, monocultures from other places. Uh, there's a slide that shows water. We're doing a lot with water utilities. People are moving water around more. And Owens Dry Lake Bed is a case in point that we love working on. It creates a lot of dust, and there's mandates to clean up that dust by stabilizing those surfaces. But LA Water moves a lot of water and a lot of power. Um, you can see fires in the upper right. Um, we've worked on so many. And everybody knows about the Angor fire at South Lake Tahoe, the devastated housing communities, the Ramey fire in Gardnerville. And fires, a lot of people think, are just re-vegged by the, the U.S. Forest Service and the BLM. But after a fire has happened, and for us, a lot of these fires are the urban interface with public lands. Um, it's not just re-vegging and stabilizing the forest areas, but we get all the calls after fact um, for homeowners, uh, state fish and game, uh, Indian tribes, Carson City in case of the waterfall fire. So we have this wide variety of people calling, looking for seed to be put out on these jobs that are primarily never going to see artificial irrigation or typical landscaping uh, mechanics. So we're putting seed out primarily in the late fall, hoping to take advantage of winter weather. We all know that drought has been an ongoing issue for the last four years in the western U.S., particularly along the Sierra Front for us. This doesn't bode well for germinating native seed. We might be able to collect and establish the seed into a seed bed on some of these disturbances that has the right genes for the plants that evolve there. But they still need the trigger mechanisms to germinate. They need a nice low pressure front in the spring when the daylight hours are longer and the soil temperatures are warming to stimulate them to grow. Otherwise, those seeds may sit in the ground till hell freezes over waiting to germinate. They need the trigger responses and they need to be close to the surface. Everything related to seeding techniques. Uh, solar's big. The panel on the right is the Bright Source Energy Plant. It's in uh, on the California Nevada border down by Prim. Six square miles of earth put into solar uh, PV panels that shine and reflect off this tower that's 500 feet high. A lot of huge solar production going in that requires a lot of work. This tells us indeed that solar has its own footprint, just like our previous mines and highways utilities. Uh, urban work here in the center screen. We have a lot of mandates in the urban corridor for conserving water, so they're taking common areas that used to traditionally just be turfed, mowed, irrigated, uh, fertilized, and taken care of, and putting them into these rough natural landscapes. The trees here might be on drips, but what you're looking at around the trees are protected areas in urban areas, this one being the foothills of Reno, that have all of our native shrubs and grasses that go back historically. It's almost like a vision into the past, pre-1850, all these plant communities. These are no longer being grazed or run for wildlife, a forage habitat. They do have their share of wildlife, but they're in a protected urban environment and fenced with some irrigation to get them established, but mandated to use very little in the future. Down here in the center is the SGI the huge growth and the demand for seed of herbs and species that diversify a plant community for the habitat of wildlife. We're not only after plants that feed sage grass, but we're after plants that harbor the bugs, harbor the animals, shelter them from predatory birds, so a wide variety of ecological functions, which demands a wide variety of seed species. Uh, ski resorts on the bottom right, big expansion in dry land work. Um, these resorts in the summer are become tourist attractions. Uh, they're being hit in the pocket for the lack of snow in the winter, and they're starting to look at summer activities. Thus, we don't want a mountainside of, of, of a war zone of construction. We want these pretty grassy, flowery places where people can play in the summer. Windmills, the bottom left part of our solar energy uh, in the desert, even in the high Sierras. It's basically a desert in the summers. 
And these ones that are up on the mountains with these steep reliefs have a lot of footprint. You can see the cut and fill slopes along these paths. This is up in the black brush, the pinyon juniper, the shrub communities. And they all require stabilization and reseeding as well. Uh, far different cry than the, than the wind plants going out in the central plains, which are basically gridded on flat ground. Uh, close up here just shows you. Right over on this upper right photo, this is a utility grid map from 2008. Right down here at Las Vegas is a major junction of utor utility corridors coming in. The grid ties between uh, Bonneville Power, uh, uh, northern plants and southern plants. Um, they're trying to tie all these areas together for uh, electrical stability across the western U.S. This particular project in the lower right is the SWIT, the Southwest uh, Intertie Project, bringing grid power down from the uh, north in Idaho down into southern Nevada to be tied into southern California. Uh, this plant used these power poles every so many feet for 400 miles. Lots of countryside to be revegetated. So this is the future of where our work is going and these projects are by no means small pies. So uh, you can go back 30 years, uh, the good old days. The, the map on the other upper left is where we traveled in a two-year period in the mid-80s. It was huge traveling. We actually had a good time in those years. We got to explore major ecotypes and land use communities, harvesting for all of these areas. But back then, we'd harvest sagebrush wherever we wanted, we'd sell it wherever we wanted, and people weren't really looking at the transfer zones or the local genetic identity within a community of Artemisia. And there's a wide range of differences within a species and between varieties within species. So we're out to harvest these and today we're much more interested in the local source being used in local projects. Um, we harvested mostly by hand back then but you can see all these machineries. If you're out in the short grass prairie, man, we get combines involved. Huge stands of homogenous grass fields. And these funny looking machines were actually homemade. This is a large vacuum down in the lower right. This entire truck was towed by another tractor. Just big vacuums, people sitting in these chairs. I mean, guys made these machines to adapt to the times and harvest native grasses where they were. This is a field harvester in the lower left out in the plains. Likewise, the plains. All the seed coming into town here in Gardnerville uh, today. Here's, here's the folks camping out in the desert. These they'd set up. Uh, a communes, compounds out in the middle of nowhere, and they'd live there for long periods of time, harvesting whatever the natives were we were after. Here's a vacuum on wheels. All of these seeds, though, were heading towards a speculative seed market, uh, not tied into a specific demand in a specific place. And it's today that is so much different than these good old days. And note, all these big machines were primarily doing grass. Today, we're after shrubs, flowers. We're working in very uh, uh, variable terrain conditions, plant communities that are much more diversified, places where you basically do not drive machinery. Indeed, we're mandated not to take machinery or mechanical devices to a lot of the places we harvest today. We are mandated to hand collect seed. So a lot of these toys still have a place and a role, but much less so, I think, today than it used to be. Thus, this photograph. This is a very historic photo of a man some of you may know, Roger Stewart, long ago deceased, 1950s, originally hoppering seed. This is where it sort of began way back when. Uh, these are pictures of myself uh, with a 20, 25 year span in between the two, using hoppers that we made today. And even today, I still have people coming in and delivering seed to us, this gentleman in the center, making his own uh, hopper that took a little of the fatigue off of his upper arm. And we have guys out there that are machinists that create their own toys of the trade. And so the story goes on. It's an ever-evolving process to, to pull in man hours of production. The goal, obviously, is that the more you bring in, the more you make. Most of these people are very contractual and very independent, and we're buying seed from them at our door by the pound. And so they uh, have their own goal to come up with the toys of the trade that are most appropriate for what they do. Hoppering is a nice benign science. When you hit a plant with a racket or a brush or what have you, those seeds that are ripe and ready to fall, fall off the plant. It's not like a cutter bar on a combine or a knife that is slicing and dicing, getting lots of seed that may not be ready to fall. This is a very benign way to pick seed. It's only getting what's ready and it's also quite messy. It leaves a lot on the ground, as I'll show you a little later. Collecting with fingers, we still do occasionally. These folks were picking a squirrel tail, Elemis elamoides, and it was so dry that there was no way to get it yet by fingers, and it was growing in a weedy area. 
Anytime you're working in weedy areas, you have to be much more meticulous about your collecting technique. Uh, mind you, if there are in a community where you're harvesting seed, no doubt they're going to show up in the material you're buying. No doubt that's going to show up in the test data if we have not the ability to clean it out using machines to clean seed. Um, knives, we use a lot of, particularly for cutting tall grasses here. You'd think we'd be running a combine. This is Great Basin Wild Rye on the farm. Um, this is collecting bee plant, Cleomy serulata, out on the native range. Uh, knives are dangerous. They have a serrated blade, and any time you're out doing a routine in the field, you look up at a wild animal, a pretty good woman, a, a thunder coming across the horizon, uh, or you fall asleep doing your routine, you're going to slice a finger with these knives, and you're going to be in the middle of nowhere. So knives have a certain caveat. We found that less expensive serrated blades, if you're out collecting seed, do a much better job um, than straight edge blades. Maybe you have a very high quality knife that you sharpen routinely for doing such work, but we buy uh, inexpensive serrated blades that are about this length. There's wider blades, there's shorter blades. Um, this is on our farm, sulfur buckwheat. We used to knife this stuff by cutting the heads off the plants, and now we uh, have, wait till they dry later and we hopper them just like we would in nature. Again, getting the seeds that are ready to fall off. So there's a lot in the technique and the hand and the appropriate technology for what you do. Every plant you look at, you have to make that decision. How am I going to collect it? When am I going to collect it? So I'm going to run through a quick dozen plants and show you the basic issues that always arise when you're in the field collecting natives. The biggest and most important is timing. Uh, how often have we driven 500,000 miles and something's not ready to pick yet or something is totally blown and we missed it? It happens all the time. And you have to resist the temptation when you get to a stand early and think it's ready to pick. These are pentamins. This uh, red Etonia is on our farm. This is a native pseudo spectabilis in southern uh, Nevada. Um, this is a native Palmer pentamin in, in uh, uh, California in the Mojave. And you notice how these ripen up the racines and, and the pods form at the base while the flowers are still at the top. None of these on these three are by no means ready for collection. Uh, Palmer Pentstemon is ready to collect when it looks like this, when you have a rough, woody plant that's left over. They've all died back except for the ground basal vegetation. Seeds are already falling on the ground. That is the time when you can go collect seed. Um, we've had major issues with impatient people that aren't going to wait around and they've collected seed early. You get low cleanouts, uh, you get test data coming back very low, and basically people destroy a seed collection opportunity when they collect in areas where we're less than this dry, dry period. Timing is an issue. You have to know your plant and you have to pick it when it's ready to collect. So that brings up an issue. Indeterminacy is the irregular ripening of flowers on a plant. This is a Balea multiradiata in the Mojave Desert, and you can see from this plant that there's variable ripening on the plant. Some of these littler heads are very dry. You could go in here and hand pick these little heads amongst these yellow flowers, but mind you, as you do such particular collections, the time involved, the cost of collecting goes up extremely. So we're after more determinate periods of time. Check out this next slide. This is also a Balea multiradiata that has had the luxury of high pressure weather, settled baking conditions where a whole lot more of the pods are around, now ready to collect. You can run through this plant with a knife selectively picking all these brown heads and get a much larger volume per hour of production in relative to the unripe yellow flowers that are here. And some of these are already showing evidence that their seed is already blown to the wind and most of it's on the ground around the plant. That's good. We're not here to take all the seed away from a plant community. We're here to get some and some that's of higher quality. So timing again is essential. And here you can see how weather plays a role in when it's ripe and how much seed will be hanging around. One good windstorm, one good hailstorm, one good pelting of big raindrops will knock 80% of what you're looking at onto the ground and you're done with this community for the year. So it's, it's a finicky sort of affair and it keeps the challenge in collecting native seed. Weeds. No doubt weeds are one of the bigger issues we deal with. You can collect seed, you can transport it, you can clean it, you can test it, and you won't find out till the very end the Lepidium latifolium is in the seed and is quarantined for sale. You've already spent all your money. 
So it's deadly when this sort of thing happens. So we have to know what's going on on the ground with people collecting seed. Those seed collectors have to know that there are issues around them, and you do not want to be picking seed anywhere near this Lepidium latifolium. You might say that you can go across the, the road and pick on the other side, but as these things ripen, the wind blows the seed, the seed rain on the entire community in this area. Hell, there might be lat latifolium way over here in the sagebrush that gets suspended in the vegetation that shows up in a lot of, of, of low sagebrush that we're cleaning out because of the latifolium right here in the field. So you got to beware. Obviously, dock shows up. We aren't going to be picking ambrosia in this field of dock uh, anywhere in this area. Balia itself, um, the, the nature of weeds, is a weed in Texas because it competes with a warm season grass as the cattle eat. We knew that, so we collected Balia years ago and took it over to Arizona and stuck it in uh, high-end uh, golf housing developments as a pretty native flower. Uh, in this slide, Schismus was collected for years. It's a non-native... Uh, Mediterranean annual grass in the spring that greeds up nicely, but out in the Mojave it increases the, the potential for big fires. It burns easily when it's dry. It still shows up on specs for jobs, and we no longer collect it and sell it and try to convince our clients not to use it. But here it is doing what it does very badly. A lightning strike in this area burns a lot of native shrubs down. Um, South Solo, just a big annual weed. So weeds are always an issue, and you have to know your weeds, know the difference between them, what you're picking, and preferably work in clean areas. Here's a beautiful stand of Malacothrix, a uh, desert dandelion in the Mojave Desert. But in amongst it are a lot of weeds and a lot of other crops, other plants. And so people get out working in the areas, and they start hoppering. Um, you can load up on weeds immediately. Um, all right, sessions on know your plants. This particular plant is, uh, uh, there's a lot of different brittle bushes out there uh, in the Mojave and Celia and Celia and Celia. Um, I can tell by what comes in my front door which of these people are collecting. Uh, the the Farinosa is more widespread, uh, the Virgin Essence is more upland, the Actonia is more western Mojave, all the way over to the Owens Valley even. So you have all these varieties and if people don't know the difference, they see it and they say, oh, and Celia, brittle bush, and they will collect it. They might mix the two together where they their ranges uh, uh, interspersed together. And, and that's deadly. We need to collect a species, and so your botany has to be pretty good to be out working in the field. Artemisia varieties, even more subtle and more dangerous. For years, people have been picking the big tridentata varieties, uh, a basin big sage at our farm, Wyoming Ensis out on the range, Vasayana, mountain big sage on, on foothills higher elevations. These three normally integrate in their areas where they meet, but they hybridize. And so I can smell when seed's coming into our office, whether we're dealing one of these or others. They have, they have distinct smells. But when you're out in the field, especially where relief changes dramatically, like here along the Sierra front, the ranges of these three accordion, they squish together somewhat that they're very close to each other. And more likely than not, you're going to be picking hybrids and not pure seed. This is very important where we're planting these locally and even way out on, on industrial sites in the Great Basin. If you're at high elevation, you're going to be working with Bassiana and maybe Wyomingensis. If you're down in the bottomlands, you're going to be working with Tridentata and maybe a, a integrating where Wyomingensis comes in. Uh, here's a low sage, Arbuscula, herbaceous sages with ground cover perennials, a frigida out in Colorado, a Ludovisiana. We love this as a colonizing herbaceous sagebrush, but that's what it is. It's an herb that dies back to the ground each year, and we collect all of these. Here's perennial bud sage out in the and very green and beautiful right now. Try to collect it with that being the lens cover right to the left of it for context. These are all different sages, and there's so many more. And they all have their niche. They all have a role to play. And if you're doing long utility disturbances like a utility corridor, um, you're going to go through plant communities that have all of these guys over the hill, down the mountain, Bajadas, into the flatlands, back up the next range. You're going to be playing with a wide variety of sagebrushes. Days gone by and we'd plant one and move on. But now we're after all of them and uniquely keeping them separate from the others. And then how do you collect? Uh, a lot of the asters, like this babia, which is sweet bush in the Mojave, you'd wait to a certain point, you'd start hoppering. The white fluffies are going to come off easier. The yellow flowers are going to be retained on the plant. Um, short windows, these things get hit by the wind and they're gone. This was a cassia stand years ago. We drove three times to this stand, 400 miles. The first time we saw beautiful flowers like we'd never seen, call in for a permit from the feds, in case the BLM in this point. Go back uh, four weeks later, it wasn't ready. These woody uh, pods were still on the plants. 
went back a week later, most of the seed was on the ground and most of the seed had already been extracted by rodents and stashed. So we missed most of it and got a little of it. Tough call. Um, you spend a lot of time and resources running around if you don't live in the backyard of some of these plant communities. And with so much remote work in the Intermountain West, uh, we are challenged to be watching over these places. It's like you need eyes on the ground or high-tech toys. Get a camera out there that you can just sit and watch from your office in Gardnerville, Nevada, and maybe there's some high-tech futures here. Drones, oh my gosh, what the potential might be. Anyway, these are challenges. Here's plants. Uh, again, asters, rabbit brush. We tried for a couple years to use big vacuums and Briggs and Stratton's on trailers behind trucks, but you're only going to go where you can take a truck and, and drag this huge hose around with a noisy engine picking this stuff. Meanwhile, guys running around with hoppers can still out pick a, a machine like this with a, uh, less of the baggage type of the heavy machinery. Lower left ambrosia, that's a hopper job. Winter fat, we used to cut. We still do, but if you catch it when the conditions are right, you can hopper. Um, and get more pure seed, leave more plant material behind, more de a benign again. You're getting a seed at a point in time and nothing else. These are all a different world compared to a cutter bar going through on a machine. Again, bud sage is so low to the ground you'd never cut this per se. It's a hopper job. But with little things like these on the ground when you're trying to hopper, you're going to be leaving most of the seed behind. A breeze blowing and rabbit brush, same idea. Ambrosia, you're going to leave seed all over. Small plants are always a challenge. We keep seeing large specks in the Sierras for Lupin Brewer right here in the lower right, but there's the penny for context. You get little pods on these little flowers, it's a legume, and try to get seed off of this. You know, three of us tried for an afternoon once and had two-thirds of one pound of seed, and we had a cost of 600 bucks right there. Uh, it's, it's a tough call. Try to pick some of these little ephemeral annuals, one, being there when they're ready to be collected, and two, getting down on the ground and collecting the things. So the market for small, short plants, you can get them on a farm, we found out the hard way and put a lot of time into overhead and getting it into row production and still have a hard time collecting it. And again, going through such areas with a vacuum and trying to pluck some of these up, you're going to be picking up everything on the ground as well. So the challenge remains with very small plants. Our industry has a bias for the, uh, more determinate species, taller things, mechanically harvestable things, things that cooperate growing in rows, but wild genes don't always cooperate. Sorry folks, we're going to have to go on challenging ourselves. Here's a Mirabilis. It's a beautiful flower in the Nictaginaceae family, which makes odd but gorgeous flowers. The way this plant works is it totally dries up to the ground. It snaps off at the ground like a sasola, a tumbleweed, and it blows along on the ground in the wind, uh, leaving its seeds as it blows. That's how it does its thing. So you basically could come and wait till this thing's a, a skeleton in the late fall, and if the weather hasn't trammeled it or cattle haven't walked on it or it hasn't already blown away, you can catch these things at that point. A lot of flowers are like this. Uh, this is a rarity, uh, it, but it grows under pinyon juniper all over the western U.S. Uh, Intermountain, down in you know, New Mexico, it's gorgeous. I think it has, of course, tremendous ornamental potential in native dry land, urban landscaping. Uh, Nictaginaceae is like that. So we're after some of these for more than reveg, uh, more so in, in the urban markets, in the wildflower markets. Timing is a, here it is on salvia, a beautiful uh, a mid, uh, I, I'd call it Mojave or transition zone in, in the black belt community or black, black brush community. Here it is in flower, here it is going to seed. This is a hopper job. You won't be picking it in this point, but some people might come in a little early and start knifing these things. And again, the time to get the good seed is when you can hopper it down here in the lower right. Same with uh, Salis area. Obviously, on the left is the flowers. On the right, the, the hoppering can go. The seeds are suspended in these little paper sacks. This is a legume in the Mojave. Uh, grasses are a little dangerous when you start cutting. You don't. People will cut on the left because a certain small seed might be ready to come out of these. But you are going to get a lot of green seed, a lot of immature seed. Test date is going to be low, and the water volume, the weight of this material, if you cut early, is tremendous. Thus, the cleanouts are going to be low. The costs are going to be high. The time to collect this is not this picture. Oopsie, sorry. It was a little late in this picture. Uh, most of the seed was blown. What was there might be empty. A lot of times, the seed that's left suspended in a plant are empties. They don't. They, 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 they don't have the natural mechanism for dehissing from the raceme and falling off or blowing away. Uh, you'll get a few seeds, you'll miss a lot of seeds. And so the time to optimally pick uh, desert needlegrass is in between these two photos.
uh, watch your sexes. Check it out. There's female plants and male plants. Uh, the terms are monoecious versus dioecious for, uh, for plants that produce one sex or the other. Um, folks will go out into a community here. This is a hopper job, uh, another Mojave uh, uh, Atroflex saw brush. But you don't need to spend any time hoppering male plants, and a lot of people won't know the difference, and they'll be hoppering both of them. And you'll be getting a tremendous amount of inert organic material and not much seed. But you're after the female plants. Like Hawaii and unsalt grass, the sticklers, here you go. You'll find uh, small areas of females uh, clonal in, in huge expanses of male plants on occasions. But you're after the females, not the males. And they look very similar when they're both dried up. Some plants grow together. Here's, here's a Fedras along the Sierra front. You have both a uh, green and Nevada Mormon tea growing together. Obviously, uh, you're after one or the other. Fortunately, there's a big difference visually in one versus the other. But uh, when they're all dried up, some people may not notice that one plant that's turquoise and one plant that's green flowering in this case. Uh, uh, this is the early green Mormon tea and the later uh, Nevada Mormon tea. So uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's subtleties here. Uh, lupins are always uh, tough to get. They, they make a, a racine with uh, flowering stalks, just like the pensamens, where you get pods at the bottom, flowers at the top. And so you're going back when you're looking at the screen on the right lower end here. You can see the close-up of this showing very brown pods that haven't shattered yet, pods that are a little green, but the seeds formed in them. And at the very pot bottom, optimally, if you're there on time, pods are already shattering. So the goal is to get these at a later state of ripening when you have some seed mid and higher level on the racines and few left on the top that are not ripe and a whole lot that's already blown at the bottom. People tend to go in and catch all these early, thus they're drying out a lot of seed, getting some good seed, some unripe seed, leaving uh, uh, too much not on the ground. They should leave some on the ground. Uh, it's just ecologically right to leave some seed behind and not have so much waste when you're at the office cleaning the stuff. Timing's essential. Uh, moved on here. Quickly on the critters, um, you're going to run into all sorts of critters out there. We've tried to teach all our employees to stay away from tortoises. Uh, don't kill rattlesnakes just because you see them. But here's the sage grouse. Um, up here on the left is a real cool one, uh, lesser nighthawks. The camouflage of these baby nighthawks under a, a shrub in the Mojave. Uh, gorgeous stuff. But we run into all sorts of beautiful wildlife out there. Um, on the lower right, I was at an Idaho Transportation Department conference once, and a federal highway man was there to make a point. The point was that we shouldn't grow large-scale shrub communities on the sides of roads where people go by at high speed. Um, we don't want to be surprised and ambushed by uh, wildlife. And so the idea is to grow lower plants on, on those edges of those highways instead of uh, necessarily larger plant communities. It was always a debate because historically we would plant very little on roadsides or homogenous communities of dry grasses. But stability on, on steep road cuts needs some diversity. We found that out by trying to just grow bunch grasses. There's a lot of erosion when you grow monocultures. And so as we moved into diverse plant communities on roadsides, we found that, yes, we were also creating beautiful wildlife habitat. And so that picture, even though a little scary in nature, it wasn't our truck, um, a little scary in nature, uh, we're, we're not going there. I don't know if people are laughing or Google and gawking or, or, or seeing horror and such things. But anyway, obviously the mandates for protecting desert tortoises in the Great Basin, Mojave, South End, um, has excluded a lot of area from seed collection because they're called ACECs, Area of Critical Environmental Concerns, where we can no longer work. All right, move on. Once you're in the field, you've got a bunch of seed collected. You can't truck, you can't move wet seed unless you do it very rapidly. It heats up, temperature kills seed, rots, just like hay that occasionally catches fire. Um, so you're out there in the field, you need to dry stuff out, get it to a low moisture content before you could package it and move it, unless you're moving at a short distance. Typically, we're moving things a longer distance. If a truck has an inner line and you leave a pallet on the side of a, a, a siding at some truck a transfer point for a day or two, well, this kid's a death for any of this stuff. It's going to die. So we do a lot of field drying. The bags on this upper left-hand tarp are dried material that's packaged and used as weight around the perimeter of the tarps. Winds do come in and pick up these things and blow them away. One dust devil takes a lot of money away. You learn the hard way more than once doing that. Uh, here's some screen activity in the Mojave. We're reducing volumes to send less material to market and again leave those materials which are native mulches back where we got them. And a lot going on out there. Lupin tarps. You have to leave perimeters on some of these tarps. You've got to know your plant. Lupin shatter, seeds fly. 
Same with ceanothesis, arctostaphylosis. We've seen seed fly 12, 15 feet from, from where they crack open. So uh, sometimes you're out to leave margins. You leave these margins and you don't cover them, then the seed blows off the tarp in the breezes. So you have to get netting and cover the screens. There's all sorts of learning curve material going on. Um, these pictures are worth a good laugh. Um, in, the, in the old days, we would do field cleaning and create machinery. We will never upper right hand screen globe mallow in the Mojave Desert when it's 100 degrees on the ground on our knees. You get this stuff dry, you package it, and you take it to your cleaning plant for cleaning. Um, we build old-fashioned machines. This was way back when. You keep a speaker with some music and a fan going, and you screen seed until you get evicted from your rental single wide. Um, gas mask. Uh, down here, we, this is not OSHA approved. We hook this old, old grain mill up to the rear axle of a truck that we jacked up into the sky. Um, this uh, girlfriend of mine was cleaning seed back then. I decided at that point that we should be married. We've been married 25 years now. It's been a good life. Um, we find old combines in people's places in the field, fire them up, and we use them for thatching. It reduces the volume of grass that we ship. Uh, we still hand screen if the occasion is right and it's a pretty place. But basically, this is what the, we used to do years back. They all had the same idea in mind, though, reducing volume in the field, taking less on the road. Today, hey, it's a much nicer world. You little assembly out into the field somewhere, fire up a Briggs & Stratton, and you got an in-house cleaning plant. Um, they get very large, and these things move across the country to industrial ag operations, reducing and cleaning seed in the field to get rid of the shipping to a, a plant or facility elsewhere. Um, China, times have changed. Um, our, this is our plant. We basically have a small batch production. Even our toys are archaic and very old-fashioned, small amounts. We still hand screen sometimes because it's faster than running some of our bulkier cut materials with lots of stems through small machineries. This won't as much involve people working in the field on small quantity, uh, high, volume, high dollar custom collections. Um, the low screen here on the lower right is the one that might most likely come into play. Um, we use small quantity machines. Uh, these are sieves. This is a Cuisinart. This is a fan. We still use this old fashioned uh, um, a mill on, on our jobs, but we also have it at our farm where we lift air up into the sky to draw the dust off. Um, this is a berry macerator that dejuices your berries for drying them out, running them through these other machines. But most of this is sort of archaic today. Big plants have glorious cleaning facilities. We're working on the clock here, 12.07. If you want to learn all about cleaning seed and you want to see fancy toys and homemade toys, you go to Bend, Oregon to the U.S. Forest Service Seed Extractory, catch them when they're given tours. It's an amazing place. In that last slide, there was a Cuisinart that I stole from the kitchen, uh, made my wife question why I bought her a new one, but I destroyed the old one cleaning seed with it. She thought I was crazy, but when we went to the Bend Seed Extractory, the first thing you see when you walk through the door was a row of Cuisinarts along the wall with modified blades inside that don't chop up up seed. Um, but this plan is where the U.S. Forest Service, your tax dollars at work, uh, modify and create machinery to clean seeds, and they do clean a lot of seed in-house for grow-outs for the Forest Service, maybe the BLM too, public agencies, uh, nonprofit groups. But for us, it's a place where you go learn and you go home and you build your own, buy your own, make your own. Um, quick little slide here on certification and testing. This might not be as important for custom collections for local source. When we are collecting seed in-house for a contract for the Forest Service, the BLM, or some private entity, um, we're collecting right there for them. The seed's not going anywhere. These tags are various levels of certification that you can get from crop improvement associations within your state, Department of Ags within your state. The yellow tag is probably the most common one for us because it's a source identified tag that certifies we collected something somewhere. But if the Forest Service is buying the seed, they are on the site. They know where we're collecting the seed. These tags aren't as necessary. They're mainly important when you're selling seeds somewhere else commercially, and a yellow tag gives it an ID. Blue tag is for genetic uh, identity. Most of this is for cultivars and, and natives that are grown on farms. The, the genetic ID is being uh, created by a plant material center. The original seed is foundation seed that goes out to commercial growers for use, primarily grasses again, but yes, shrubs and, and forbs are a big time because there's a growing market for them. Um, this is what a test looks like. This might be of more value to custom collectors. If you buy seed locally or in-house or you have small quantities, you want to know that there's actually seed, uh, viable seed in it. 
Well, you take a, a bag of it that's representative of the material you've collected and cleaned, and you send it to a lab. There are private labs in most states, and there's a, a state-operated labs in most states. I prefer to use the state labs in the states that are in the areas that deal with the plants that we're collecting. They have a lot of experience with those. So in the Intermountain West, I'm using the state labs in Wyoming, Utah, Montana, Idaho, and even Nevada's lab is trying to pick up speed in that department. But we go to those labs because they're used to cleaning sage brushes and rabbit brushes and various shrubs and the, and the dry land grasses and a lot of the natives that aren't commercial grown. Um, down on the lower left, just a little thing that we like, a, a new age technology that's in my smartphone called troglodyte. You can see the upper left. It IDs this slide for the date we took it, where it's located. There's your geographic data for exactly where it's at. And this is handy for when I'm looking in a field and where we're doing a custom collection. Um, they can see from this photograph that exactly where I collected the seed. I would say that this slide is more valuable to me than for this yellow tag up here uh, for most of the custom collection and local source work that we're doing. And, and even, even the, the field agents working for the agencies have various uh, uh, location toys, uh, GPSs, you know, the old, old, old Garmin toys you can still use. But this camera toy is a, is a unique, valuable toy that happened to be very inexpensive to put into your smartphone. So we're moving on as much as we can for these future technologies. I just got to get that drone up and running. Okay, sorry folks, this is a slide that will bog you down just a little. We're getting close to the end of my, uh, my slides. I highlighted in green the pertinent information here, contemporary California and Nevada specifications. So these are specs that are now coming out on jobs where we're supposed to bid seed that has been locally collected and has very specific requirements, parameters surrounding the quality of the seed. Upper left says seed mix needs to be weed free. Most states allow a small amount of weeds in their uh, seeds that we're selling there. They're not noxious weeds. They do not allow noxious weeds, small amounts of restricted weeds. But here you have a spec calling out weed free. That obviously limits what we can sell for this job or what we can collect that has any weeds in it. Unfortunately, many weeds aren't classified with some of the testing facilities, so something shows up that's a native crop in a meadow somewhere, and if it's not on an identified weed or crop list, they throw it into the weed list. So we have it's more of a political issue there, and they have to be brought up to speed on it's not a weed. But also here, though, are high elevation collections. That automatically limits what you can use that's been farm grown in lower elevation, unless sometimes the seed has been grown down there that was brought down from higher elevation, if that makes sense. Uh, down here, here, this is a more uh, a sort of an echo of the Tahoe Bond Act. Seed must come from within 1,000 vertical feet of the job site or within 50 miles of Lake Tahoe. The Bond Act, Tahoe Bond Act, prefers, uses the word shall a lot. They aren't they aren't absolute in this because they'll also say uh, they will allow some of these uh, specs will say uh, they will allow substitutes that are are approved by the resident engineer on the job site. So if you have species that could not be collected locally or farm grown locally, they will sometimes allow substitutions that we have that are from a local area. Down here on the left, uh, oopsie, sorry, uh, I wrote, uh, is this one even possible? A lot of old-fashioned specs that used to do nothing but sell grasses and for turf or for pasture jobs, they have a spec in there that says 90% pure, 80% germination. Uh, for most of our natives that we collect, um, we'll never get such high purities, never get such high germinations. The genetics of those plants, the stress communities in which they're grown, we're not coming in with such high numbers. Um, our typical atroplex salt bushes, for instance, might have a fairly high germ if we clean them out real well, but a lot of times they're down in the 50s. Uh, Artemisia, sagebrush, which we collect tremendous amounts, will rarely have a purity over 30%. Germinations may hit 80. So this is what we're selling. So we cannot satisfy this spec by definition. We have to go back through the agencies to whoever wrote the spec and get their approval to sell a lower purity and germination test but at the same time, we sell the pure live seed specified for the job, which is what these numbers are on the right. Pure live seed in here in the upper left-hand column. We will supply 30 PLS pounds per acre. 
but down here in the lower right, our pyridines and germs will not hit these amounts. We can talk about this at a later time. It's complicated, but what, what these slides are basically showing is that the new age demand, the new markets, the new specifications that we deal with today are much more particular about what's in the bag. Um, the one on the lower left is the same. It's showing high elevation shore seed, but also I'm a little scared of these specs because over here on the right, this spec is calling out 128 pounds. You know, this has kilograms per hour per per hectare here, but uh, here's a 97 pound per acre rate. These are huge volumes of seed, far in excess of what we normally deliver to jobs. These guys might. Uh, the equivalents, these, uh, these uh, pounds might put down over 2,000 seeds per square foot on a job site. There are rationales for why they do this, but the cost of these kind of blends exceeds 2,000 per acre. And when it's your tax dollars, uh, you can run out of seed availability and run out of budget really quick on these jobs. Uh, let's move on here. Why sometimes they're now including in these specs not only weeds, but they don't want to see seeds of cheatgrass, uh, alfalfa, and sweet clovers. And why? Uh, it's because of jobs like this. These are jobs where we supply the seed. Uh, upper left is a, a riparian corridor at Lake Tahoe. There was no yellow sweet clover in the seed blends or in the seed tests for the seeds within the blend. Yet nothing grew here year one but yellow sweet clover. Okay. Um, likewise, job on the right here. Uh, this job was a job that called for dry land grasses for these berms on the west front of the Carson Valley. Initially, nothing grew but tall fescue. The seeds were not in the seed blends. Uh, down here on the lower right, a huge mine site we did out in, in central Nevada years ago, 400 acre seeding of native shrubs and grasses, some introduced species. First year, nothing grew but kochia, annual kochia, not the forage kochia that we sell, but annual kochia on this job site, which is a, these are aggressive colonizing species that grow in the void of other plants on new disturbed bare soil conditions. And you have to say, well, if they weren't in our seed blend, how in the hell did they get there? This is the ongoing discussion we have all the times with contractors, with clients in the field, but there's lots of reasons how the seed got there. A lot of times it's historically there. In any historically grazed area, such as this guy's yard, some of the soils on these sites have been in grazing, hay production, cattle grazing for a hundred years. The soil may be loaded with the seed bank of other species. Likewise, up here at Tahoe, Tahoe had a history of grazing, mining, logging, doing what we did for the last 150 years, and now we're moving it into watershed restoration, urban landscaping, keeping Tahoe blue, big budget up there for doing all of the above. Down on the lower right, there's also the idea that all these weeds are blowing around in the summer and fall, and the seed ecology people would talk about seed rain. This stuff comes down on the ground. It's tracked onto the soil. This mine site took a bunch of salvaged topsoil material, mixed it in with it some glorious organics that they brought out of Idaho, and a bunch of seed from us, and went and tracked it up onto these mountain sites. And a lot of times we also find the very machinery that took the seed up there and the soils is tracking those weeds as well. But what I can say for sure is that over the years, I've seen a lot of these sites that started out as 100% weeds turn into early seral colonizers that we wanted, amid seral communities of disturbance natives, and eventually back to the original communities that we were targeting in the beginning. It's just that it takes a while. And in the short term, maybe these weeds are playing a very nice colonizing role of stabilizing these soils from major rain and wind events. Uh, they might be robbing nutrients in the short run, but they might be providing an ecological role. So we can do a whole discussion on when is a weed a weed. Okay? And my clock says I'm going to run out of time shortly and be ready for questions. Um, and here's the granddaddy of them all. Here's a specification up at Tahoe, which we are working on. It's challenging, but there's an asterisk of a three by every single species on both of these lists. Number three says, seed shore shall be from the Sierra Nevadas above 4,000 foot elevation. So there you have it. Their ultimate desire is to have it coming from just up there. They even attempt to put in minimum purities and 
of percent germinations down these charts. And like you can see here, they have acknowledged there's a lot of variation in what we sell, and there's now historic records of what we're picking and selling and where we get those numbers to be at. They're, they're a far cry from that 90-80 spec that you saw a minute ago. But I don't think you really need this column at all as long as we're going to provide you the PLS pounds per acre at whatever purity and germ they come in as long as we are not introducing weeds and that the species is clean enough, the seed blends are clean enough that they will flow through the machinery, whether it be a ground broadcast toy or a hydro seeder, and putting those seeds onto these disturbances. But here I wrote down a host of the issues that you have when you move into challenging yourself to collect and supply these kind of seed specifications versus the good old days of 9080 grass. Um, right here on the left side, there is a loop and brewer. I like that little teeny short picture I showed you with a penny next to the flower, and they want it from up there. And here's 13 pounds of seed per acre on a job that's a couple acres. 16 pounds of lupin brewer ice, I challenge a seed collector to get it, and I challenge a grower to grow it, and in such volumes that we could even do a little two-acre job with it at a budget that we could afford to supply. So with all these in mind, this from the demand side, ratcheting up what we put onto the mountainside for jobs is a big issue. Um, it's a big challenge. Um, also, though, on the supply side, let me show you just a few slides. They as well have ratcheted up over the years the hoops that we have to jump through to collect native seed. This is an old BLM SPAC on your upper left, a, a seed collection permit, excuse me, for us to collect seed in Winnemucca, Nevada. Down here on the lower right, there were some handwritten special specifications that we had to qualify for when we went up and collected seed. And they will say such things as no mechanized machinery off-road collecting seed, no vehicles leaving existing roads, all sorts of requirements that are basically mandated and collected seed. Here's a 500 pound quantity estimated and here's a little clause that says we're going to give them 10% of the seed of the value of the seed or the seed in trade for this permit. A lot of times the districts have wanted some seed. This is special local genetic material for them to use for small disturbances or to send out to growing contracts to expand the local source genetic material. And so that's what we're doing. They also routinely ask for 10% of the market value of the seed on a PLS basis or 10% of the bulk material value of what we're collecting out of the field. And all those numbers are negotiable because uh, a lot of the data isn't known about what we collect. But a permit is from the feds and we have to give them something and they have requirements for us to, to handle. These uh, handwritten notes on the left side are now written in stone on some of the contracts in these generic terms. Collect uh, no mechanical equipment, vehicles on roads, call the forest service when you start. No more than 30% of the seed from an individual plant. Do not collect from recent burn areas. 5% of the seed given to the forest service district. Down here, the 30% of the seed becomes 20% uh, in this highlighted line. Okay, it is the collectors responsible for knowing where they're working. All these things are are keeping us toe the line for treating the area with respect. Down here at the bottom, all trash created by the collector must be removed. I drove by this seed collector's camp in the lower left a few years ago. They weren't there. They had seed there. I knew it was a seed collector's camp. But there was garbage everywhere. This is bear country. This is tourist country. There's an image that we have to abide by working where there are tourists, working where there are bears. Mandates that say you collect all your garbage. If seed collectors start violating the terms of these selection contracts, they're given the industry a black eye and the day will come where we don't get to collect at all. And so these guys were told by the Forest Service to pack up and move on. You can't be doing this sort of thing. Image is important. I once heard about a seed collector changing out the transmission on the rear axle of his truck in a campground where tourists were living. He was stuck there and he had an issue. Um, we usually don't stay in campgrounds. Some of the specs even say, you're out there in the country, we want to know where you're camping, but please uh, uh, respect the, the tourist interface. That is big business and we have to abide by those rules. It makes sense. Image is important. Clean up our act. Okay? So those are hoops we're jumping through for the for the 
supply side of our business. And here comes the bring it home. Um, when it comes to those 20 and 30 percent clauses, what is a seed collector in the field to do? Shall we collect off of 20 or 30 percent of the plants? Um, we aren't collecting all the seed off of any of the plants. Uh, when we're hoppering, we're sending seed flying. These are just a couple examples. Um, atroplexes where seed is flying all over the place. These are before and after shots when a plant has been hit with a hopper. They look dramatic, but there's still seed all over the plants. There's seed all over the ground. This gentleman gets some in his hopper. A lot of seed's not ripe and ready for collecting. We show up late, seed is all over, seed's gone, and we have this mandate to collect 20 or 30 percent. Sometimes it says of the plants themselves. Sometimes it says of the plants in the community. They all say collect from the widest variety of plants possible so you're supplying a wide variety of genetic material. All of these bushes aren't the same genetically. Some are leafy, some are sticky, some ripen early, some blow seed off early, some are late. And so this is nature protecting its seed bank. All the eggs aren't in one basket. They're protecting themselves from people like us. So I think we are abiding by the permit uh, uh, in our hearts, but there are people that will try to get every single seed, and with knives that can be dangerous. These two lower pictures are a buckwheat plant where, oh, 90% of the seed is picked off of the plant with a little left on the ground. Well, fortunately for all of us, this is on my farm, and on my farm I can tell people to go cut everything. But uh, you might recall I mentioned earlier, we're now hoppering this plant instead, which means we are leaving a little more on the ground, and we do have young plants coming up all around these plants. On our farm, that's a good thing. But the impact of a knife is obvious by this photo versus the impact of these photos looking at these. So hoppering is more benign than knifing whenever you have the ability to do that, and it should be looked at favorably. Uh, custom collection contracts. Here's more new age stuff from the uh, agencies and what they request from us. We are collecting for the agencies, sometimes in-house, when at the same time we can't get permits from them to collect for industrial sites in their districts or in other places outside of their districts. But these contracts show collecting by the pound in bulk quantities, Here's collecting by field pounds harvested in the field. Up here, there's a contract where they give us a small amount of money and say, go collect by the hour, and this is your limitations on what you can do. Um, prioritize lists. These are neat. They're not saying exactly what they want us to collect for them, but they say, we'd like to get more of these species than these ones down here. They understand the nature's not always going to allow us the perfect list of what they would like. Um, some years we might get nothing of other, some species, other years uh, we might get more of others. Weather's always wreaking havoc on any particular year. And so we like contracts that acknowledge out there that nature isn't going to always cooperate with us. Up here at the upper right, they have a list here where to collect all these species, uh, but not necessarily in any particular quantities. Down here on the right is Endow. I wanted to throw this in because it was a hardcore learning curve. Uh, they wanted uh, 5 to 10 PLS pounds. They called us on December 1st last year, a little late for collecting sage. We went out. We offered to do it for $1,000. We went up and collected a whole bunch of material, spent $1,000, got back to the farm, cleaned it out, and had 1% viability. Essentially what we collected, there was no live seed on the plants. It was either all on the ground or it blown away. But we were called to go up there on December 1st. It was a last minute job. Well, do the best you can. We went up and did the best we could. Um, all of these jobs scream for a little advance notice, please. Uh, big industrial jobs, we like a two year window so we can collect a whole bunch. Retest, tests are current, but we'd like to have the time to collect so, because we're going to be hammered by nature. Um, we got to see what's going on out there each year. But, so this is tough. Um, this shows what's happening in the field. We're being limited where we can work. Um, my time's about up without questions. Sorry about that. Um, these areas down in the Mojave Desert are excluded from our operations. Military lands, national parks, rec areas, the Mojave Scenic Preserve, a new preserve coming in, and the National Trails, uh, Highway 66 Route National Monument might become a real place where we're banned from collecting seed. Well, if you take away all these places where we're not allowed to work, we can't get any seed. 
Um, here's Las Vegas down here in the lower right. They are giving us a certain preferred areas where they'd like us to work. Notice how little that is relative to the LA BLM districts in general. But it's not all their land. There's rec areas, preserves, tortoise habitats, military lands, you name it down there. We are increasingly being excluded from where we can work on the public lands, yet we're being mandated to supply seed that's locally collected for jobs. Those mandates, in part, are written by the same federal agencies that are restricting our access to the public lands. Therefore, my last slide, one of the biggest limiting factors for us is this list of, of restrictions we've had over the years. This is just a sampling all the way back to 85. Uh, exclusionary zones, uh, delaying tactics. Uh, um, the feds don't know what to do with us, yet they're mandating our seed. So we need to get in consistency with the federal government if they want us to supply seed to big industrial projects that go get permits to build solar plants in utility corridors, highway permits for highway departments, and they mandate or encourage the use of local source seeds, yet we can't get it. So that is my take home message. We're having a good time, no doubt. Um, but it's getting harder and harder without some sort of consensus on what seed companies can do. NEPA documentation to allow our benign activities out there on the public lands. Uh, thank you. Sorry about the delay. If there are questions or you'd like to contact me later via Jeannie's uh, 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 email list, I'll, I'll, I'll entertain those questions at any time. Um, let me know. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of done, and I'm not quite sure how this works at this point. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, good. There you are. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Ed. Um, yeah. So we do have a couple questions. If you have some questions, feel free to type them into your questions pane. Uh, the first question is, what is the rationale for using 90-plus PLS pounds per acre? That rationale, like quick and dirty. Um, Scientists have analyzed undisturbed plant communities next to disturbed plant communities where we're doing reveg work. And they have documented the amount of seed in a seed bank in the soil that might have been perpetuities in its own evolution getting there. And they decided, well, maybe that's what we should put back in the ground then. I think it's a good intention, but I think it's a little off base because as I told you earlier, the dollars involved, the rarity of some of those species, the amount of work that we have that's demanding those species. And if you successfully get a project off the ground and running with a good dose of colonizing species, things that are genetically supposed to go away as ladder seral starts to move in, and then those ladder communities start coming in, basically the seed bank is going to evolve like the soils are evolving and the microbials that are colonizing those soils are evolving, moving out of bacterial possibly into fungal communities, into, into you know, a dynamic um, of all of the plant and soil communities that work together in, in a natural evolutionary way. So I, I think the seed bank is going to evolve in the soil over time. It is our goal to get establishment on the ground physical that allows succession to take place. And I don't think we should be putting that much seed down on a job. And I think we should be spreading the rare budget dollars that are available around on a lot more jobs because we could burn up everything we collect in a year. The whole industry could if you do specs like that on all the jobs there are. Okay? Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question, are there changes you'd like to see to testing and labeling of seed? I'm not a big fan of the BLM's mandate of yellow tags. A lot of that comes from different states, ag departments, like ENDO in Nevada here, Department of Ag, um, where they can have a yellow tag program and certify seed in their states. It works real easily if the Department of Agriculture in a state is doing that for a farm. The farm doesn't move, the seed is grown there. But we do native collections that are all over the place. And, and to do a field policing of that is tough. And unfortunately, a lot of states don't even have a budget or an active Department of Ag to do that. So we rely on other states, state agencies, to help police and enforce and administer a federal mandate through the BLM for seed that they purchase through central purchasing in Boise, Idaho. So I don't think that they should do that. Um, I have plenty of ways I verify my local source seed. If, I'm, if I have a federal permit, 
their district is policing what I do on that district, uh, probably much more so, I think, than somebody out of state. And if we have our in-house jobs that we're doing and we have our new technology that documents what we're doing, I think those documents can support um, a local source job like we have. Surely there's holes in policing such a, a, a way, but I think there's lots of holes in the current system as well. It's just that it's mandated and, and I'm, I'm heading in a different direction a lot of times. I've had trouble getting yellow tags sometimes and other times I haven't, but I don't believe that the policing of what I'm getting is always that accurate and I can see how it could be abused just as what I'm proposing could be abused. I think we have to broaden our, our context there um, because some states just don't handle a program. So what do we do where we harvest a lot of seed? Great, thank you so much. Um, and finally, you mentioned a couple times um, the serial stage progress. In, mm -hmm. your, in your experience, how long is, does it just vary depending on the site or um, is there an average of how long it takes for a native community to come back? Oh, I wish I could answer that question easily. Um, the, in the short term, we need something to stabilize the soil, and that might not even happen. You get these last three, four years in a row of, that have been dry. We've had so many job sites that were started, and sometimes with relatively good assets in the ground, knowledge about what they were doing, and still nothing grew. But then a year later, a whole bunch of things good happen. Uh, instead of all the weeds coming up, the perennials start. Or some years they both start and you wonder if the perennials are going to win when they're inundated with annual weeds. But looking back over 30 years, I've seen so many projects that eventually stabilized and did quite well. It's just that it can't happen immediately. You can't have a textbook perfection. If, if I had time to have shown you a few successful projects, some of those have been because nurse crops started immediately. A lot of native colonizers are available that we use, unfortunately not commercially, but we're trying to get more of them um, because they play a big role. They not only come on strong quick, but they die off like they're supposed to instead of dominating and making an alternate climax down the road of some sort. So I have confidence, but there's so many pitfalls. That little neck in the hourglass where a contractor doing it wrong or not knowing that you don't bury seed a foot deep. The wrong toy planting the seed. A uh, seed that doesn't have good specs or old seed that was stored or contaminated seed. The soils they're using, um, the, the agency that's not policing, the resident engineer who doesn't care. Um, and even under the best of circumstances, nature has its own way of wreaking havoc. I like to say nature's serendipity wreaks havoc on our mentality that we can cut up, cookie, cookie cut the, the natural concepts of soils and and, and plant materials, all the little ecological parts that you break up that compose a niche. You think you can just put those together and magically have XYZ happen next year in December or January. Too many uh, big corporations think money can buy success and they're humbled when nature takes its turn in wreaking havoc on their best laid plans. And we can talk about that till hell freezes over at any old conference or, or program you want to. But uh, I have so many samples, examples of serendipity and future success and so many samples of, we get lucky once in a while when every single seed in a, in a blend comes up out of the ground, both colonizers and late cereal climax. We had one Mojave job that we struggled with for years and lo and behold, they had five inches of snow that sat around for a week during a freak winter event years ago. The following spring was the most magic moment, and I'm convinced that that one in 500 year event in the Mojave Desert helped to make it happen. Uh -huh. And so we, we're humbled by all those instead of trying to fight it and think that you can work out why it didn't happen. We have enough whys they didn't happen to, to fill suitcases, and, and we're still puzzled each year by why it didn't work here and it worked over there. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Thank you very much. Uh, that You're was welcome. That looks like the last question. Thank you all for your participation. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three question survey of this webinar that will appear after the webinar has ended. I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon and the link will be automatically sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. Our next webinar, Fuel Breaks in Winnemucca, presented by Mark Williams from the Winnemucca BLM, will take place next Tuesday the 26th. 
If you have further questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please email or call me anytime. Again, thank you for your participation today, and thank you so much, Ed, for your presentation. You're welcome. Hope you all had a good lunch, except for me. <laughs> well, now you can. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks again. Have a great day, everybody. Mm -hmm.